Hello, my name is Barbara Koblen. I'm a DARE Extension Master Gardener volunteer with the DARE County Center of the North Carolina Cooperative Extension. Today's discussion is about drought tolerant plants. With all the changes that are occurring in our climate, warmer winters, hotter summers, less rain, it is necessary to reevaluate our gardening and landscaping routines incorporating plants that are better able to handle dry conditions. We're going to discuss water conservation. Plants that once established can tolerate the hot dry conditions of the Outer Banks summers. Plants that are common to the area and available at local garden shops. And these include annuals, perennials, shrubs and trees and how to plant and maintain your choices. Water conservation is very important to the Outer Banks because our lives depend on healthy waters. Think of all the activities you do in Dare County that depend on clean water. Pollution has become a problem not only in our area, but all over the world. The leading form of water pollution in North Carolina is stormwater runoff. Stormwater runoff is rainwater that does not soak into the ground. This rainwater runoff flows off hard surfaces, such as streets, rooftops, driveways, and parking lots, and carries pollutants directly into our waterways untreated. Water conservation is important because there are times our annual rainfall is low, and of course the summers are usually very hot, also during the summer, there is the increased population from our visitors who also need water. Xeroscaping means landscaping with water conservation in mind. A xeroscape or water-wise landscape will require minimal supplemental water after it's established. North Carolina is not considered an overall dry environment but we do experience our fair of dry spells during drought conditions. It is these stressful times that will test the hardiness of a drought tolerant plant. Thankfully, North Carolina is home to more native plant species than perhaps any of the other states. In fact, North Carolina is home to more plant species than all of Europe put together. Many of these species are very tolerant of seasonal dry conditions, and you will find they will usually do better than exotic or hybrid plants. The simplest, most efficient rule you can apply when gardening is to pick the right plant for the right spot. How do some plants manage to be drought tolerant? Drought tolerant plants have built in features to minimize water loss and maximize water uptake. Plants may have reduced leaf areas and bear small leaves or needles, such as in the case of evergreens. Some drought tolerant plants with large leaves have deep indentations between the lobes in the leaves to reduce their leaf area. Another sign of drought tolerance is leaves covered with a heavy accumulation of wax, such as that seen in the white fir. This wax serves to conserve water within a plant. The presence of fine hairs on the leaves of some plant like silver sage is another adaptation that traps moisture at the leaf surface. Then there are drought tolerant plants like false blue indigo that have deep roots that pull in moisture well below the plant's surface. Remember, a plant that is labeled drought tolerant does not mean that plant prefers hot dry weather or that they will not be affected by long periods of dry weather. What it does mean is that plants should be able to survive a moderate period of limited moisture once it is established. Begin with planning. Putting the right plant in the right place based on that plant's needs is so important. You must be able to say to a plant once it's established, if you cannot take care of yourself, 
you cannot stay. When planting your landscape or garden, you need to consider the soil type and drainage, areas of sun and shade, the areas that have problems with wind or salt spray, deer and other rodents eating your landscape, and the type of irrigation to be used. Group plants with similar needs together. Grouping plants based on their water use is one of the most functional ways to arrange plants within a landscape. When plants with similar water needs are placed together, you can decrease your time and water use. Aim for the highest number of low to moderate use water plants in one area rather than high water use plants mixed in with the others. Low water use plants need extra water only during establishment or the first growing season depending on the type of plant. Moderate water use plants, once established, require water only during limited rainfall or when they show signs of stress. High water use plants need frequent watering throughout the growing season for the duration of their lives. Consider plant location. Plantings need large trees will have to compete for water with the tree roots. Plantings in open areas are affected more by wind and sun, which cause evaporation of water. And shaded soil, although it loses less moisture through evaporation than areas in full sun, doesn't make for happy plants that don't like shade. Plant only what you can water. Plants need the most water immediately after being planted and during establishment. Before choosing a plant, make sure that you're prepared to provide enough water during this time period. What do I mean by established? New growth is usually an indicator that the plant has survived transplant shock and is being provided with nutrients and moisture from the soil. Perennials, shrubs, and trees take a little longer to establish than do annuals. This can be the first growing season or up to two years depending on the plant and the conditions. Prepare the soil. Preparing the soil can assure rapid plant establishment and better root growth. Adding amendments such as compost depends on the structure, texture, and water holding capacity of the soil as well as the type of plant. The goal is a moist, well-drained, well-aerated growing environment. A soil test is a good way to find out what amendments you need to add. Soil test kits can be obtained from the Dare Extension office in Manio and are free except for postage during the months of April through November. You want to plan to mulch because mulching helps to insulate the roots from heat, controls weeds, prevents erosion, and decreases the need for water in the garden. Three to five inches of mulch, such as pine straw, pine bark, aged wood chips, or compost, help to conserve moisture. Irrigate conservatively. Plan the pattern of irrigation to meet the water needs of a particular plant zone. One size does not fit all in plant irrigation. Apply water as slowly as possible to improve absorption by the soil. Apply a thorough soaking of soil once a week, which is better than frequent light watering. Frequent light watering dries the soil surface quicker and promotes shallow root growth. For individual plants that need more water, Considering using plastic milk jugs or liter bottles with holes punched in the bottoms, partially bury the jug near the plant and fill it with water. The water will seep out slowly and give the plant a thorough soaking. Once the plant is established, remove the bottles. What type of irrigation should you use? Well, they're simple sprinklers. These are devices attached to a garden hose with spray adjusted to cover large areas of the garden. A complex sprinkler is a system of underground pipes and pop-up heads. This is most often used for lawn management. 
do not use either of these systems for landscape beds or vegetable gardens. The high humidity in the air combined with the water wetting plant foliage is a wonderful way to encourage mildew, mold, and fungal diseases to your plants. Drip irrigation is practical and dependable. It applies water slowly and directly to the roots where it is needed. It can be as simple as soaker hoses as seen in this picture. Now I want you to look at this picture and see the water that is oozing out of the soaker hose. That's the way the plants get wet and their roots get wet and they get the nourishment and the water they need. But also look at the hose that is slightly above the ground. And the reason for this is soil sometimes clogs the hoses, the water in the hoses and causes problems and you don't get the soaking that you need. A more complex system uses small flexible pipes and flow devices called bubblers that you can add wherever you want water. This usually costs much less to install than complex underground systems. The equipment can be purchased from big box stores and you can install it yourself. Drip irrigation results in minimal evaporation and water runoff and uses 50% less water than sprinkler irrigation. Hand watering is useful for newly planted gardens or plants showing signs of drought related stress. Apply the water directly to the base of the plant. Do not wet plant leaves. And I mentioned the reason for that earlier. Water slowly enough for the water to be absorbed by the soil and if runoff occurs, move to another area and return to finish the watering. Apply about five gallons of water per 10 square feet of garden area. Check the output of your hose by calculating the number of seconds it takes to fill a gallon jug. Water gardens early in the morning. Between six and 10 a.m. is the best time. There's less wind, lower temperatures, less sunlight to cause evaporation. But drip irrigation can be operated any time of the day because the foliage stays dry. Use an automatic controller on irrigation systems to save water. Monitoring the irrigation system and adjusting the controls as conditions change is what you want to do meaning that you're obviously going to use less water in April when it's still cool than you would in August when it's awful hot. A rainfall sensor prevents the system from operating if significant rain has occurred. A soil moisture sensor can override the system if moisture is adequate. Learn the symptoms of drought stress in your plants. The leaves of some plants show marginal leaf burn while others will wilt. Learn the difference between normally daily leaf burn in dry periods and really hot days versus leaf wilt, which is a sign of drought stress. Plants such as azaleas, hydrangeas, and dogwoods show early signs of drought stress and are good indicators for the need for vigilance. Others such as impatience wilt under the hot sun, but revive as soon as shade is needed and provided. Feel the soil before assuming the plant needs water. How do you care for your gardens after planting? Use fertilizers judiciously. Remember, it encourages new growth, which requires the plant to use more water. Pay attention to the proper amount of fertilizer and timing required by the particular plant. Do not fertilize in late winter or fall unless the planting instructions tell you to. Because if new growth appears then, it is very sensitive to cold weather and it can damage the plant. Over fertilizing can damage roots. Avoid pruning during drought because it stimulates new growth on the plant, thereby increasing the need for water. 
A quick response to signs of insect and disease can damage plants and cause additional use for water. Now, let's talk about drought tolerant plants. The plants which you will see are only a few of the many plants which are drought tolerant and grow in the Outer Banks. All of the plants discussed in this presentation require only the minimal amount of time, water, and attention once established. They truly take care of themselves. First up are annuals. They add color and diversity to your landscape. These plants can be transplanted after the danger of frost is passed and the soil warms up. Resist the urge to plant too early because plants don't like cold soil. Most annuals will bloom almost constantly if you remove the spent blooms. Dusty Miller is used mostly for its beautiful silver foliage. They do have yellow flowers in the summer which some people like and others don't, but they do attract pollinators. If you look in the center of the picture, you will see three leaves, the center of which is a cauliflower shaped head. That is the bud forming. My advice would be to pinch that bud off because if the bud is allowed to grow, the energy of the plant will grow into the flower and the reason you're planting Dusty Miller is for its silver foliage. So just pinch that little bud off. Dusty Miller can grow up to 24 inches tall, prefers a dry soil, and it can develop root rot from too much water. Water only when the plants begin to look wilted. Fertilize once or twice during the season. And you wanna pinch the plants back to keep them compact during the growing season. Or if they do get leggy, cut back the stems on a 45 degree angle, dip in a plant hormone, place in a moist soil, and you have propagated a new Dusty Miller plant. Gallardia, or blanket flower, or Indian blanket, is a native plant that grows all over the outer banks in the strangest of places, along the highway, in cracks in driveway, in meadow areas, but resist the urge to transplant these because they will not transplant. Instead, you want to buy your Gallardia from the garden centers because these plants have been bred to withstand transplanting. They bloom all summer long and they grow to 24 inches tall. Remember, they need full sun or light afternoon shade. Water every two to three days for two weeks after you plant. This will tolerate a light salt spray. Deadhead the flowers for new blooms, and once established, it's very drought tolerant. Lantana blooms summer to late fall. It grows two to four feet tall, although there are some dwarf varieties. It's available in annual or perennial varieties. It prefers full sun. It needs only a little water during dry periods. Fertilize it monthly. Prune occasionally to keep the plant compact and to stimulate new blooms. For the perennial lantana, mulch well in the winter and wait until spring to prune it severely. This is because the plants have hollow stems. If water collects in those stems and freezes, the plant may be damaged. The varieties that bloom very well on the Outer Banks and are certainly winter hardy are Miss Huff and Moselle. I've had my Miss Huff Lantana for at least 15 years. Petunias bloom all summer long and everybody likes petunias. They grow to one foot tall, need full sun, water every three days for two weeks, but remember to water in the morning to decrease the chance of mildew. Once established, water weekly or less. Mulch well, deadhead regularly, and fertilize it monthly. Rose moss, portulaca, purslane, or blanket flower grows early to midsummer and will grow up to 10 inches tall. It needs full sun. Cut the plants back in August when they get leggy 
or deadhead the plants on a regular basis and you will be rewarded with a lot of reblooming. Apply fertilizer lightly when first planting or use a time release fertilizer when you transplant. Vinca, aka Madagascar periwinkle or rose periwinkle, should not be confused with impatience because impatience have a very similar flower. Vinca leaves are shinier and thicker. It blooms in shades of pink, lavender, red, and white and will bloom from late spring to frost. It grows up to 24 inches tall in sun or partial shade. Water it regularly until it's established, usually for the first month. For an annual, it's unusually drought tolerant, and as an extra bonus, it just may seed itself. Let's move on to ground covers. These are plants that are often overlooked for the garden until you discover a spot in the landscape that just cries for a ground cover. Ground covers provide foliage cover all year long, reduce the incidence of weeds, and when mature, reduce the need for mulch. There is absolutely nothing more stunning than an area of blue rug creeping juniper. It is perhaps the most gorgeous of all the ground covers. It's an evergreen which produces this beautiful blue-green foliage, grows, shoots six inches long, plant it in late spring to early fall in full sun, water five minutes twice weekly for the first month, mulch it well, fertilize each spring and fall, and needless to say, it works beautifully in borders. English ivy is the plant you cannot kill. It's an evergreen ground cover, which produces runners that can grow six to four feet long. It can be planted almost any time of the year in partial to full shade. Space your root cuttings six to 12 inches apart because once it takes off, it takes off. Water well when first planted and after very dry periods during establishment. Once it's established, you may forget about it. Fertilize once when establishing a new bed, but then no more. It can cause problems if allowed to grow up the sides of houses or trees and is known to become aggressive in spreading. And if it does spread, you'll have to pull some plants out or prune it back severely. Liriope should not be confused with mondo grass or monkey grass as they are different plants. It blooms in midsummer with these purple flowers that are resembling grape hyacinths. It grows to 18 inches tall. Depending on your situation, select the green liriope for sun or the white variegated liriope for shade. But they both grow well in both conditions, in any soil as well. Space the plants 15 inches apart as they spread rapidly by stolons, which are above ground runners and by terminal tubers, which are below ground runners, put out by fibrous roots. Fertilize it planting and mulch well. Water well after it's first planted and then limit irrigation unless it shows signs of stress. And if you wish, you can trim the leaves in the winter. Vinca, or periwinkle, or myrtle, has evergreen leaves that produce flowers in the early spring. These flowers are gorgeous, and there's nothing prettier than a wide area of Vinca with these beautiful flowers. Plant in the spring or the fall in shady locations. Water regularly for the first two weeks. Fertilize every other year and trim the plants as needed. These also, like ivy, tend to grow places where they shouldn't, and you can prune them back sharply or pull out some of the plants but once it's established, it's very drought tolerant. Drought tolerant perennials. Remember to deadhead spent blooms to encourage more bloom production. Fertilize once a year and divide every two or four years for a healthy long lived plant. Bee balm, also known as bergamot or Oswego tea, blooms early summer to fall. 
It attracts hummingbirds, bees, and butterflies. Plant it in the full sun to the afternoon shade each spring. Water twice a week for the first two or three weeks. After that, then water only if the leaves look wilted. Fertilize sparingly and mulch well. Deadheading encourages continuous blooms. Thin the beds when the plants get too thick to improve air circulation to avoid mildew. Black-Eyed Susan is the state flower of Maryland. It blooms all summer long and grows to two feet tall. Plant it in the spring in full sunlight. Water new plants thoroughly and every five days for the first month if there is no rain. Fertilize and mulch well in the spring. It grows abundantly and may have to be thinned for when they are happy, they have a voracious growth so much so that one of our Mr. Gardeners donates 100 plants each spring to our plant sale, and then the next spring there's another 100 plants to donate. Cut the stalks back in late fall. Leave the flower heads on the ground for the birds to harvest the seed, and remember that this is food for these birds. It's maintenance-free once established. Cone flower grows in the summer in the eastern part of the U.S. and into the Midwest prairie areas. It grows two to five feet tall. Plant in the full sun or the light shade in the spring or fall. And if grown from seed, it will flower the second year. In extreme drought, water every only two or three weeks. It does not need much fertilizer and it will rebloom if deadheaded. Cut the stalks in fall, but leave on the ground as the centers contain seed, which are a wonderful food source for the birds. Coreopsis or tickweed is also a native plant that grows all over the outer banks, in drainage ditches, along the highway, in meadow areas. It has yellow flowers that bloom spring to fall and it plants in spring or fall in full sun. Water twice a week for the first three weeks. Fertilize after the first blooming. Deadhead the flowers for greater plant bloom density and divide and transplant the crowns in the fall and give these new plants to your friends. It's essentially free of pests and diseases. Daylily blooms late spring to early fall, depending on the variety. It will grow one to four feet tall. You want to plant it in early spring or late fall, but keep in mind, it needs six hours of direct sun daily for blooming. If it doesn't have six hours of direct sun daily, you will get foliage, but you will not get blooms. Water it well until the plants are established and then you can forget about it. But remember to fertilize each spring and fall. Fern leaf yarrow or golden yarrow blooms all summer long and grows to three feet high. It grows well in poor soil and full sun. Set the plants three feet apart to decrease the incidence of mildew as air circulation prevents mildew on these plants. Feed monthly to increase flowering. Deadhead and prune the foliage to increase the number of blooms. Use cut blooms to create beautiful dried flowers. Dry the flowers by hanging them upside down in a dry, dark place for about six weeks. Hardy salvia blooms midsummer to late summer, and it's a welcome addition to the garden because by then the annuals have begun to stress out from the heat. This is a flower that attracts pollinators. It grows one and a half to five feet tall, depending on the variety, but it grows in full sun. Mulch it lightly, divide in the fall, only water occasionally in dry weather. Fertilize in late summer and make sure you deadhead those flowers. Russian sage blooms early to midsummer and gives the garden a wispy, airy look. It grows three to four feet tall prefers an acetic soil. Set the plants three feet apart in full sun as these can spread and become bushy. 
Trim the stems each spring to encourage shape. Fertilize in September or October. And once established, it can withstand terrible neglect. Goldenrod produces clumps of tiny flowers on tall spikes from August to November. It can grow from two feet to six feet tall. Plant it in full sun to partial shade. Water it well until it's established. It tolerates a moderate amount of salt and wind. And there is seaside goldenrod growing on the leeward side of a sand dune down at Oregon Inlet. So you know it's a tough, hardy plant. Goldenrod and ragweed are distinct plants that both bloom about the same time, August 15th to first frost. Goldenrod has bright yellow flowers, where ragweed doesn't even appear to have flowers, only pollen stalks. The flowers that might appear are white and very inconspicuous. As a result, goldenrod gets an undeserved reputation for causing allergies while the real culprit is the unnoticeable and insignificant ragweed plant. The balloon flower, stone crop, or autumn joy sedum, blooms mid to late summer and like salvia, is a welcome addition to the garden because it's new and fresh. It grows one and a half to two feet tall. Plant it in full sun in late spring Water it well when planting, and then again two weeks later. Mulch sparingly. Fertilize each spring. It needs infrequent water during very dry weather. And prune the woody stalks after frost. We're moving into drought tolerant shrubs. These are shrubs which have learned to adapt themselves to the outer banks. The following are but a few but you will recognize them and notice them all over the place. Butterfly bush is one of my favorites. It's also called summer lilac. It has blooms in pink and purple and blue and lavender and yellow. It grows five to 15 feet tall. Plant it in the spring or fall in full sun. Water it well during the first year. Don't let the soil get too dry. Mulch it well, fertilize sparingly as it blooms better in less rich soil. Remove the spent blooms to have flowers all summer long. And in late winter, prune it to 12 inches high to produce a fuller shrub. Japanese dwarf holly has evergreen foliage and will grow two to eight feet tall. It adapts to a wide variety of conditions. Plant at any time during the growing season. Plant it in the sun to partial shade, but avoid wet soil as it doesn't like wet feet. Water it well during dry periods until it's established. Mulch it well. Trim in late winter to early spring, only to keep the shape. Nandina, this dwarf variety, has leaves that turn orange to red in winter. This variety does not produce berries. It only grows two or three feet tall and tends to be a little bushy. It requires little maintenance after established, which is the first growing season, and has become popular at malls, townhouse developments, and schools due to the fact that it requires such little maintenance. Plant it in the spring to fall in the sun, but it can adapt to shade. Water every third day for the first two weeks. Fertilize it lightly each spring or fall. And thin the mature plants in the spring to remove some of that bushiness. Indian hawthorn produces pink or white flowers in late spring. It can grow up to four feet tall. It flourishes in hot locations. Plant it in full sun to partial shade. But this plant wants alkaline soil. Water every third day for two weeks after planting and regularly during the first year. Mulch it well. Prune in late winter to remove any winter damaged foliage. The flowers bloom from old wood, which means this year's flowers bloom on last year's new growth. 
Pittosporum comes variegated or plain, but both varieties produce these tiny yellow flowers that are fragrant. It can grow 10 to 15 feet tall, and if desired, you can prune it to a small tree. Plant it in late winter or spring in partial shade or sun in an acetic soil. It grows best if protected from the winter wind. Water weekly during the first season. Fertilize in March and know that it's very drought resistant once it's established. Dwarf spirea produces tiny clusters of pink flowers in the summer. It grows two to four feet. Plant it in the spring or fall in full sun three feet apart. Water every three days for the first two weeks, then weekly until it's established. Fertilize each spring and trim the flowers in the summer to produce fall blooms. Prune in late winter to remove any excess twiggy growth. Viburnum has pretty pink to white clusters of flowers in early spring and comes in many, many cultivars. It grows six to 10 feet tall. It prefers full sun, but can tolerate late afternoon shade. Plant in the spring, preferably in an acetic soil. Fertilize after flowering. Water during dry spells for the first year, which means water once a week if there has been no rainfall. Once it's established, it's very drought tolerant and trim the plants only to maintain their shape. Now it does have one problem. It tends to get leaf spot disease, but if you rake up any leaves that have fallen to the ground, this will probably prevent this problem. Wax myrtle or southern bayberry or wax bayberry is a plant that blooms all over the outer banks. It is a native evergreen foliage with spring flowers that are not showy at all, but produce gray berries. The leaves smell like bayberry candles. It grows five to 20 feet tall. Plant it from spring to fall in partial sun or shade. Tolerates any type of soil. Water three times weekly for the first month. Fertilize and prune annually in the spring. It produces an abundance of suckers from the base of the plant. These may be considered undesirable. If they're pruned off, you can give the appearance of a small tree rather than a shrub. If you prefer a shrub, leave them alone. The abundance of many leaves group tightly together, give birds protection from the elements and predators. The roots replenish nitrogen back into the soil. We're very fortunate to live in a place that has five areas of maritime forest. Many different species of trees grow in these areas, having adapted to the climate eons ago. The following trees are choices you can make for your landscape, which once established are leave me alone, I'm fine trees. There's nothing more magnificent than a mature bald cypress. The needles are light green in the spring and turn to rust in the fall. The first time I ever saw a rust colored bald cypress, I was sure it had a fatal disease. They can grow up to 100 feet tall. This is a deciduous conifer, meaning it loses its leaves in the winter. It grows moderately fast and it tolerates wet or dry soil and it rarely needs additional fertilizer. Crepe myrtle, which is prized by most everybody on the Outer Banks, is sometimes called the tree of 100 days because a mature crepe myrtle can produce blossoms for three months. It blooms mid to late summer with white, pink, and lavender blossoms and many colors in between. It thrives in hot, sunny locations. It will grow in any type of soil, although if asked, it will tell you it prefers acetic soil. Plant it in early spring. Water weekly until it's established. Fertilize each spring and prune only with attention to shape. 
The eastern red cedar is an evergreen that produces blueberries in the fall. It can grow 10 to 40 feet tall, plant it three to six feet apart as it does bush out. It does best in dry soil and full sun. How's that for an Outer Banks plant? Uh, water it well until it's established. It's a slow grower and best of all, it's free of insect pests and diseases. The Hollywood juniper, very dramatic, is a slow growing evergreen with branches that twist as it grows. It grows 20 to 30 feet tall. Plant it in full sun in the fall. It will grow in acidic or alkaline soil and it's heat and salt tolerant. Water it well until established and thereafter forget about it. The last tree is the live oak sometimes called the southern symbol of strength. It has evergreen foliage, but it's not a true evergreen. It can grow 100 feet tall, except on the outer banks, where the wind makes a regular habit of pruning it constantly. It needs lots of room to grow in full sun. Plant it in fall or winter, mulch it well, water twice weekly for one month until it's established. It has tough, leathery leaves that resist salt spray. The leaves drop in late winter or early spring when the new growth pushes the old leaves off. And it produces an abundance of acorns, which is a staple food for wildlife. Well, what have we found out? We have discussed the importance of water conservation, water, deeply and infrequently, water the soil, not the plant, water only when needed, water early, not late in the day. When planning, study the garden, prepare the soil, and choose plants with like watering needs. When you establish your plants, understand that water needs increased until new growth appears. There's a large variety of drought tolerant plants available for our gardens locally. Ask a Master Gardener is available if you call at 252-473-4290 or email us at greenlineouterbanks at gmail.com. For those of you that want to know if there are more plants available, the Extension Office has a more complete list of annuals, perennials, ground cover, shrubs, and trees. If you would like this information, give us a call or email us at greenlineouterbanks at gmail.com and you will receive your information. That's about it for today, and a thank you again for your attention. Take care.